And thank you. Thanks, everybody, for having me today. I'm uh, very privileged to come back for a second day. Um, we're going to talk today about uh, vaccines. There's been a lot happening with the pandemic. Uh, we're entering into a new phase. Vaccines are being rolled out. We're hearing different things on the news every day. And um, I was invited just to come and talk about this topic. I'm going to go through a number of questions that you as residents have pre-circulated uh, to the team at Park, And I'm gonna try and do those questions justice as we go through. So I'm gonna be reading off the question, giving you my best answer. And then hopefully towards the end, if we have time, we'll have a, a chance for some questions and answers if I'm leaving anything um, is still burning at the top of your, uh, top of your head. Uh, so I'm gonna start going into the questions that you have asked us and uh, we'll have a chance at the end to, to recap. So fascinating and insightful questions. These are exactly the questions that we're asking ourselves as a healthcare team, as a province. Um, and so there's a lot of insight and very, very relevant questions here. So the first question, probably the most important and the one that we put at the front, the one that I'm probably gonna be the most vague around uh, but I'll try to be as clear as possible. The first question was, when will we get the vaccine? So the best answer that we can give is very soon. Uh, yesterday, I felt a little more confident saying within the next few weeks. Today, a major announcement from Pfizer that they have revamped their construction of the vaccine in Europe. So what that means for us is that over the next two weeks, we're going to have a lag in our vaccine delivery to Canada. That is not as dramatic as it sounds. And the number, when we think of the numbers of vaccines that will be delivered over the long term, meaning the next eight weeks or 12 weeks, it doesn't impact what we're anticipating happening in February and March. It impacts a little bit what's going to happen in the tail end of January. So, so far today, we have vaccinated 90,000 people in BC. Uh, in this month, we were anticipating about 780,000 vaccines being delivered to Canada. Next month, we were anticipating about 2 million. So what's changed for us is over the next two weeks, we're gonna have a slight reduction. We're having no vaccine delivered next week and then about 50% reduced the week after. And what's happening is Pfizer is retooling their, their construction facility so they can get out 2 billion doses by the end of the year from that one facility in Europe. So they've been trying to communicate with every country around the world, all of whom wants a piece of this vaccine. Um, they have been clear that this is a short-term reduction for long-term upswing in their ability to deliver. So when will we get the vaccine? Very soon in coming weeks. Bonnie Henry has still said that we are going to continue to deliver the first dose of vaccine to highest risk individuals. And then they're going to be doing some math and figuring out when they can give the second dose to those same individuals. So we will know in coming weeks when each of us as individuals will get the vaccine. Um, more broadly, I'm spending a lot of time on this one because this is in the news right now and you're going to be hearing a lot more about this tonight or tomorrow morning. Right now, BC is done phase one. So we have given the first round of vaccinations to everybody who is at highest risk. Uh, emergency room physicians, frontline workers, um, people who happen to live in long-term care facilities. And we're done that phase of vaccine delivery. Phase two is individuals in the province who are 80 years and above. And then shortly thereafter, 75 to 80. And so we're going to be going down by five-year increments, capturing everybody who's at the highest risk for serious complications of this virus um, and, and working along people who live in the community. Park and independent living facilities are a unique situation where people are healthy, independent, active, but still live in the same, um, the same building. They will uh, cohabitate in certain areas of the building. And so there's special attention being given to independent living facilities like Park. Right now, you are safer than the average person who is in that 70 plus range. Uh, we know that facilities like Park and the safety protocols that have been put into place have made you actually much safer than the average person in the population and much safer than the person in 
uh, assisted living or long-term care. And so while we're very, very conscious of preventing spread, we're also aware that right now you are as safe as we can make it. So as soon as we can get that vaccine out, it'll be in the next couple of weeks. A much longer winded answer to that question that I had yesterday, but that's because much has changed in our landscape. Second question was, where will I get the vaccine shot? In our residence or in another location? Um, so again, long uh, independent living facilities have, have posed a very unique opportunity. So in a perfect world, we would have the vac vaccine brought out to park facilities and delivered at the site. One of the challenges we're having is with the cold storage of this vaccine. So Pfizer, and I'll get to which one we probably will be offered at park, um, Pfizer uh, has to be stored at a, at a very, very cold temperature, minus 70 degrees Celsius. And the transport times, and then once you um, put it into liquid, it needs to be used within six hours. So the transport times, plus the need to use it very quickly once it's thawed, is posing a logistic challenge. So getting it out to independent facilities might not be as easy as we hope. It might be that we have to set up communities of vaccine centers and we have residents attend, but uh, the province is working through that actively right now. Question three, which vaccine will I get? Of the potential vaccines, which one should I take? Is one better? Uh, fantastic question. So no, one vaccine is not better than the other. In BC, we've got access to Pfizer and Moderna. Both are equally effective. The first one that, that's made available to you, take it. Um, is either one better? No. Um, when will the second dose be given? So the two uh, medications, the two vaccines differ a little bit. They can't be given sooner than 21 days for the Pfizer or 28 days for the Moderna. They can't be given sooner um, for the second dose, but they can be given longer. Uh, so the second dose will probably be given in BC somewhere around 35 or 42 days. Um, well, you'll hear a lot about 21 or 28 days, and that seems to be somewhat controversial in the, in the news or in the public press. Uh, the World Health Organization, countries around the world have evaluated, is the vaccine still effective? Are we putting people at harm's way? Are we, uh, are we doing harm to our populations if we space out that second dose too long? And it seems right now, even if we're giving it out to 42 days, it's just as effective as the 21 day mark. And so while the, the vaccines were studied at the 21 and 28 day mark, now that we have some real world experience, we're comfortable administering that second dose out to 35 or 42 days. Um, and so when will you be given your second dose? Much will depend on the supply. It could be as far out to 42 days, but that's not doing our population or you as individuals any harm. Um, can I catch COVID from the vaccine? No, you can't. Uh, this vaccine is not made from any live virus. It's not made from COVID virus. It's not made from a, a related virus. It's only a fragment of a molecule that's found inside the virus. So there's nothing in this that's transmissible. You can't catch COVID from the vaccine. How effective is the vaccine? Can I still get COVID even though I've had the vaccine? So I'd like to break up the effectiveness of this vaccine into two important concepts. So first, both of these, they're 95% effective in preventing any COVID, vaccine, um, COVID infection. So they're 95% effective in preventing you from getting COVID. Now, there's a different kind of COVID. Not everybody who gets COVID gets serious COVID. In the big trials, both of these vaccines were 100% effective in preventing death or serious illness related to COVID. So nobody ended up going to the ICU or on a ventilator or passing away after contracting COVID having had the vaccine. So it's very effective at preventing even minor disease, 95% effective, but where it really matters, it's 100% effective in preventing serious COVID illness. Um, so that's important to, to consider. The second part of that question was, can I still get COVID even though I've had the vaccine? Well, about 5% of people did get COVID after having the vaccine. Far, far better than a placebo or far better than getting nothing. 
but still about 5% of people got, got COVID. They ended up being COVID positive, but with very minor symptoms, fever, runny nose, or minor symptoms of COVID. So overall, the vaccine is extraordinarily effective in making people safe. If I get the vaccination, is there a chance that I will be asymptomatic and transmit the virus? Yes, that 5% of people had minor COVID. They had uh, come in contact with the virus through their environment and they were transmitting the virus, right? So they had symptomatic COVID, about 5% of people. So is it possible that even after the vaccine, you could be asymptomatic and still transmit it? That's possible. And that's gonna be really important to remember when we go on to some later questions, trying to ask about why Bonnie Henry would have the strategy that she might have to have going forward. I'll, I'll talk, talk more about that in a bit. So there is a chance that you can be asymptomatic and still shed, even though you are protected from the vaccine. It primes your immune system, protects you, but if you do come in contact with COVID and happen to be transmitting it, uh, that can still happen. Question eight was, if I already had COVID and I have antibodies, do I still need the vaccine? So yes, we know that the live virus behaves differently in different bodies and different people's immune systems are subtly different. So people can get the live virus and not develop a profound immune response to the second or third infection. It depends on what part of your immune system uh, is reacting against what part of the virus. So we do know that people who have had COVID will benefit from the vaccine. And we're recommending that even if you've had COVID in the past, you get revaccinated as we go through this. Another question, a very important one, what are the side effects of this vaccine? Um, so we break this up into two forms of side effects. So first are local uh, injection related side effects. Remember a vaccine is designed to provoke an immune response. It is trying to cause inflammation. So where you get your injection, people will often have all the things that you, that you will have experienced in the past. So redness or soreness or stiffness of the muscle, um, swelling, uh, pain that might persist for about two days. The second are what we call systemic side effects. These are uncommon and these are not symptoms of COVID infection, but people can get fever, muscle aches, um, nausea, and there's reports of people even vomiting for two days or so after they receive the, the injection. Um, uh, another question around that was, will those symptoms be worse if I'm taking any specific medications uh, or if I have any other illnesses or if I'm lactose intolerant? One question came out um, if I'm allergic to egg. So no, there are no medications that you could be on. There's no illnesses that would put you at higher risk of those side effects. Another question was how long would those side effects last? Usually about two days uh, and they go away. The systemic ones, feeling um, unwell in your whole body, muscle aches over your body, nausea, uh, diffuse muscle aching. Those are more common after the second shot where your immune system is really kicking in. The first shot, much more common to have just local side effects. And remember, the vast majority of people don't have any side effects at all. Um, another important question, I have allergies or I have a suppressed immune system. Is it safe to take this vaccine? Yes, but there will be a lot of questions posed to you when you go to get your vaccine. And remember, this is gonna be given by a healthcare professional. They're gonna have a checklist. You're gonna know what you're getting into when you're going in for your injection. And they're gonna to wanna to make you as safe as possible. So part of that is they're gonna have a little questionnaire for you about what medical problems you might have and whether you have any of these conditions. Allergies. There are some allergies that might prevent you from getting the COVID vaccine, but they're not common. There's something called polysorbate and something else called polyethylene glycol. These are chemicals in the vaccine, but it's not the actual virus fragment itself. But people who have uh, had cosmetic uh, allergic reactions or certain hair product allergic reactions might have an allergy to polyethylene glycol. And so we'll have some questions about that. Um, questions about suppressed immune system. Uh, 
they will ask about high dose steroids or chemotherapy drugs or illnesses like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis that might suppress your immune system. There are still people who have those illnesses or who are on those medications who get the vaccine and are very safe. So having those doesn't prevent you from getting the vaccine, but the healthcare practitioner would wanna go through risks and benefits in a little bit more detail with you around those. So remember, you'll be in, you'll be talking to a healthcare professional, you'll be going through a questionnaire and there'll be chances for you to dialogue with more specific questions about your individual health, but allergies, suppressed immune systems, people are still getting vaccinated safely. Uh, question 11, if I take the vaccine, does that mean I can travel, roam around freely with no mask and do all the things that I did pre-COVID? No, uh, we can't yet, but that's the goal. That's the whole, that's the whole purpose of this. Um, I know our family is different. I can't imagine um, independent living in a facility um, and not having that freedom that we've all um, strive for in our lives. So I know that this can, uh, this is a very important question. Going back to that concept of being asymptomatic, but still being able to transmit virus. The travel restrictions are partly to keep us as individuals safe. They are largely to keep the rest of society safe in addition. And so even as we get immunized, it's gonna be a while before Dr. Henry is comfortable relaxing those travel restrictions or those visitation restrictions or the um, social distancing restrictions. Because we don't know who else at the grocery store or who else in the group has had their immunizations yet. And beyond that, who else in their bubble have had their immunizations yet. So if I take the vaccine, does that mean I can travel or roam around freely? Not yet. She's balancing public health with individual health. I don't envy that job uh, one bit. She will try to get us there as quickly as possible. Uh, how long after getting the vaccine do we know we are protected and how long will protection last? So the first dose of that vaccine is 92% effective at preventing illness. The second dose brings you up to 95%. So that's a really important concept. So how long after the getting vaccine do I know I'm protected? Within about seven days after getting your first dose of vaccine, we already saw in the trials, uh, the incidence of COVID fall off dramatically. So within about a week, you are starting to be protected. And after that first dose, we're about 92% protected. That second dose brings that up to 95% for these two vaccines. And the worldwide experience and the expectation from immunologists and infectious disease experts, people who do nothing but study vaccines, suggests that the benefits gonna last at least six months, probably out to one year or more after the first vaccine. This is a new virus, we're still getting to know it, we're still getting to know how the human body reacts to this virus, but there's every indication that once we are immunized, that immunity lasts a long period of time, years. Uh, how much will it cost me to get vaccinated? Uh, nothing. Uh, are there any long-term consequences of vaccines? No, not yet reported. Um, there is a lot of work that's going into this area. Uh, the entire globe is aware that we have rapidly introduced this into our population. It was not easy to get this vaccine into the hands of people like me who are trying to immunize our patients. Um, it has been very well studied along that course and seems to be safe. There are local, provincial, national, and global organizations who are taking a look at every single person that gets vaccinated. And then we actually have to log any unanticipated consequences of that uh, vaccination so that we can understand globally if there are things happening that we don't yet understand or we can't recognize in small numbers. So are there long-term consequences of vaccinations? No, not that we are aware of, and it has been very well studied up until this point. We're aware that it was very rapidly implemented and to make people safe, there's a global network who's tracking every single complication 
even with that information, and we've done 90,000 people so far in BC, it appears to be very safe. Uh, should I wait to get vaccinated until more research has been done? No, uh, we would not be actively vaccinating people if in very large numbers, we saw safety and effectiveness. This would not be delivered to you unless we have already studied it enough. Uh, last question was, did the vaccine trials include seniors? Uh, very explicitly, yes. They were asked to, they had to. We knew that people who were uh, 70 or above were having higher complication rates. So Pfizer had about 22% of people uh, over the age of 65 in their trial and Moderna had about 25% of people over 65 in their trial. So very specifically, it was effective in this age group. It was safe and tolerated in this age group and seemed to prevent serious illness in this age group. Um, so when it's offered, if you're comfortable, you talk to your provider, talk to your family doc for another opinion beyond what uh, I'm telling you on a screen, uh, but it was safe and, and well studied in, in your population and, and was very well tolerated. Those were the questions that I had uh, pre-circulated from you as park residents. Um, I hope that I'm doing them justice. Um, Louisa, I'm sure we have a few minutes if there's further questions from the, from the group. And thanks for having me back for a second day very much. Thank you, Dr. Diggle. And now over to all the residents. If you have some questions that Dr. Diggle did not answer, could you let the either the active living manager or the wellness nurse uh, who is available there at your residence know? And they will just quickly type it into the chat and we'll read them out and they can be answered. So we have about 10 minutes for that if everybody wants to uh, put forward any burning questions you might have. And if you can use the Q&A, um, the question feature, that would be great. Um, also, there's a number of attendees that have joined us today. You can also put forward your questions on the Q&A uh, feature down at the bottom of the meeting as well. So, I see one question in the chat. May I read it? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, there's one uh, question coming in. Is there blood or blood products in the vaccine? There's no blood and no blood products in this vaccine. Great. And Dr. Diggle, feel free to answer the, and read out the questions as you see them come up and that can work perfectly. I will do. Although I'll tell you, sitting through that two days in a row, a neurologist talking about vaccines, you can't have a drier afternoon, people. You did very well. <laughs> I, I, really, um, I really appreciate the time to actually speak about this. We do get a lot through um, uh, the news, a lot through communication with our colleagues and friends. And so uh, I appreciate a chance just to touch base and let you know what's happening provincially. So really appreciate that, Louisa. Another question, what about RH, residents or residents with kidney disease? So residents with kidney disease should still get vaccinated um, there is no preclusion to being vaccinated with, um, with kidney disease. A good question from Bertram. Pfizer reportedly was against changing the period between vaccinations. Why? So when we think of how we use medicines or vaccines in general, we talk about on-label or off-label. We often talk about things that were uh, studied and in the trial, what was shown to be effective. And then we look at the real world experience and we, we ask whether or not it's a, uh, a strict requirement or if there's ways to relax that. 
to meet the real world demand or the real world experience. So often our doctors will use a medication that was originally studied and approved in one condition, but it's also effective for not just one type of diabetes, but another type of diabetes. And so even though it was studied in one type of diabetes, it's used in both types of diabetes. It's a bad example because I'm not an endocrinologist, but what has happened is um, the vaccine was studied at a very specific interval. Very appropriately, the company is saying, well, this is what we studied and this is what it was approved on. So we'd still recommend going forward with that 21 day interval, but the broader medical community is giving additional data beyond those original trials. So even the World Health Organization has identified that the, the Pfizer vaccine is the second dose effective even up to 42 days. And so we're aiming for 35 here in BC. So short answer is the real world experience is broader and deeper than the clinical trial experience. And that's why Pfizer and the rest of the world are discussing how to best deliver this. Okay, I see a few questions here. Where will park residents get vaccinated? We are, well, even as of Sunday night, so 36 hours ago, uh, we were talking about exactly that. So independent living facilities where it just makes so much sense to send in a person or a team and get everybody at that facility all done on the same day. We were talking about exactly that strategy, which just feels so right to most of us. It's very centered around the patient's health. It um, allows us to be very, uh, not numbers oriented, but you can count who's getting it. You know who's in the building. You can do an inventory. It's, it's reliable. You know you're capturing everybody because it's a closed unit. That is our preferred strategy. Uh, we do not know if we can deliver on that preferred strategy. Getting the, uh, the ultra cold storage and getting the actual uh, vaccine, reconstituting the vaccine, and then using it within six hours is proving challenging when we, when we try to model that across multiple, multiple different independent living facilities. So the province doesn't know yet. They have a preferred course of action. They're working to get there um, and they're modeling. That's a very political response. I know what we wanna do. We don't know if we can do it. Are we assured that both doses will be coming from the same company? Yes. So if you have the Pfizer uh, vaccine for your first, you will have your Pfizer vaccine for your second. Uh, the province is tracking each one of those. You'll be given a little card with your vaccine on it, which vaccine you got and the date for the recommended second dose. And then you're going to be tracked by your public health nurse. Uh, we, I'm not sure if you're on the same one I'm on. I have shingles vaccine that's due in February. Are we able to get that at the same time? And would they interact with each other? A great question. They do interact with each other. So you don't want to get your COVID vaccine within 14 days of another vaccine. Okay. Um, I don't believe that that would make you miss a window to receive your COVID vaccine. Uh, but you're going to want to make your vaccinator aware of that. And they're going to have that on their little checklist. Uh, I've, we've, I've read this checklist. I've delivered this checklist. Uh, so they're going to ask you if you've had any other vaccines within the last 14 days. If they do, they'll probably reschedule for a few days hence. Uh, but you, you, you need to be aware that there is an interaction between those vaccines. Don't hold off your shingles vaccine. If that's pre-scheduled and we're being vague, necessarily vague, not purposefully vague, but if we're being vague about when you get your COVID vaccine, don't delay your shingles vaccine if your doc's already lined that up. And is there formaldehyde in the vaccine? There is no formaldehyde in the vaccine, no. Uh, do we know or can you share with us how the vaccine will be given at the site? I think you covered that. Um, and will we leave the site? I think you covered that as well. Yep, maybe, hopefully not. We're not sure. The cold chain supply is gonna be our rate limiting step when we start to think of how to get this to the population. And then this is unlikely to happen, but what would happen if someone received the vaccine earlier, oops, than the recommended time? Hmm. That has happened. And we actually have guidelines for that. Um, so we have, you know, in some, uh, some cases in the States, we've um, 
called down nursing unit three East to get their vaccines. The next day we call down nursing unit three East and some people show up twice. It makes the second dose less effective. If it's too early, we, we generally would accept up to 18 days. We don't want to come any earlier than 21, maybe out to 18, it's still effective. But if you're closer than that 18 days back to back, probably your second dose is going to be as effective and you might need a third. You probably would be flagged for the public health nurse to really talk about that with one of the public health doctors to um, identify how to best uh, immunize you. But 21 days is too close together, 18 days of the outside, anything closer than that, you're a special case and you'd be looked at very specifically. Great. Not, not in an intimidating fashion, but just how to get it, uh, uh, get you to full immunity, making that sound like a punishment of some sort. Are there any health conditions that would preclude you from getting the vaccine? And is there a list of those conditions we can look at? Okay. No, there's no, there is no health condition that would preclude you from getting the vaccine except for uh, an allergic reaction to those two chemicals, polyethylene glycol or polysorbate. If you had an allergic reaction to that, probably the process would stop for you. And probably we would look at other vaccines coming down the line. So we haven't talked about the other two. They're not improved in Health Canada yet, but the AstraZeneca and the Johnson and Johnson vaccines are very different than the Pfizer and the Moderna. So there's probably other strategies for you um, if you had an, an allergy to this. Beyond that, there is no absolute contraindication or meaning an absolute reason why one of your um, conditions would prevent you from getting the vaccine. As your health becomes more complex, your risk and benefit becomes more complex. But that's why this is going to be delivered by a healthcare professional. These people are trained vaccinators, public health nurses, uh, public health physicians, specialist physicians. Uh, they're going to be there to make sure that you're safe as an individual. So we're not applying this to everybody without your knowledge and your, your, your consent um, and without knowing that we're doing you more harm, uh, more, more good than harm. Great. I think I missed one and I don't want to miss this one because a lot of people have asked it. Um, When's the general public going to be uh, vaccinated and how will they get notified? Okay. So we are going to be using a lot of registries. There's lots of small registries. Your family doctor knows who you are and knows who they have in your practice. Uh, we know through uh, school registries who are in school uh, aged uh, groups. The general public will be notified uh, through um, age brackets. So we're going to be starting at the highest risk people, 80 plus, and we're going to be going down by five-year increments, uh, decrements, uh, as the vaccine becomes available. So as we know the vaccine is being shipped and we have this many doses, we will be calling individuals in certain age brackets. Along those lines, uh, we'll be leveraging things like uh, public health, public health uh, numbers, uh, registries within family practices and family practice doctors, hospital registries, and other um, public health registries. Um, let's see. Uh, here's one. Is an EpiPen available at site in case someone has a severe allergic reaction? I, I don't know why I'm giving this talk. You guys are asking all the right questions, everything. You guys could run your own vaccine program. So yes, we actually have a little vial of epinephrine and a little preloaded syringe right at the station. Yes. Yep. Everybody, every single indi individual has one right at their beck and call. We had, we had uh, one person faint uh, in Langley at one of our immunization clinics. Um, the ones that I've done, we've had no complications, uh, no side effects. So overall, it seems well tolerated, but we've got the, the epinephrine there just in case. And this is a question we had yesterday, and I think it's a great question. Will any residents who are living in our residences that are under 80 get the vaccine at the same time as residents who are over 80? Yeah, we think so. Uh, that makes uh, the most sense because everybody's cohabitating or co-located. Um, we want to make everybody safe in that facility. So uh, because you're all in essentially the same residence, 
the, the hope is that we're able to deliver that to everybody, regardless of age bracket in one facility. Um, that story is evolving rapidly. We have never immunized 5 million people all at once before. And we're also aware of supply chain issues, meaning um, we are not in control completely of everything that determines our destiny. The uh, Pfizer, the international, even our national draws on that vaccine will ultimately be our rate limiting step in deploying this, but that's the goal. Yeah. Um, do you see any questions we have missed, Dr. Dickoff? Um, I do not. I've got one important one coming up in one second. I just saw one come up in the chat, but the q and I do not, no. So uh, one of the last questions uh, was, what's the risk of dying from the vaccine? Uh, zero, we have not had a real world experience of that yet. Well, here's a question I missed. What happens to any future residents who are ready to move in, um, but they haven't yet? Will they have access to the vaccine if they move in in the next three months? Hmm. Well, I am also going to sound political around that. In theory, if somebody's moving in, they will be in a comparable age bracket, and hopefully we also will be um, addressing their vaccine and prevention at or around the same time that everybody in the facility is getting it. Um, if individuals are coming in to a facility uh, that's already been immunized, you as park residents would be safe. We'd have to specifically address uh, that individual's vaccination state, meaning did they fall through the cracks? Uh, were they in the community, didn't have a GP, nobody knew anything about it? Um, some people uh, speak English as a second language and aren't as well informed of what's happening in the news and they didn't self-identify. So if we do have people coming in, um, again, the park processes have been very, um, very robust. What, what I mean by that is so far we have not had a case from a park facility. So there would have been, I presume, a, a checklist or a inventory of some sort knowing what that person's risk profile would be. So yeah, if somebody's coming into the facility and we've missed them in the community, that will give us a chance to catch up with their immune state. Okay. I think we have time for these last two questions here. Um, when will residents who have been vaccinated be able to travel within Canada? As soon as the public health restrictions are relaxed. We have now immunized more people than have had COVID. So we are on the, the tail end of this. And um, I'm not saying that to make anybody feel better about the process or feel better about where we are. We still have months going forward in this journey. Um, I think that's gonna be one of the biggest challenges that our public health colleagues have is at what point are we safe enough uh, that we can start to use uh, our own individual common sense, our own judgment. We know our own immune status. And as we travel around, those of us who might have been immunized already, um, who are we putting at risk? So that's the part that Dr. Henry and the ministry are needing to think about constantly. Who are we putting at risk by relaxing? I would anticipate probably by March, Dr. Henry is gonna be able to relax some of the local um, protection. Probably later this year, we're going to see some international and national um, safety regulations that are coming online that still make everybody safe. Great. And I think the last question here is from Mulberry. What if I'm hospitalized at the time the vaccine's given? So can I get it later? Yes. Okay. Yep. Public health doesn't want to miss anybody. Great. Uh, Oceana, are you typing or are you finished your questions? <laughs> oh, I think they're finished. Oh, Oceana residents have thoroughly valued this info session. <laughs> Thank you. No, I, it is, I, this is, I was so intimidated thinking of giving, it's been, I talked to a lot of doctors, I give rounds. I have not talked to a group of patients in years. And so this was, I was actually more nervous. I was telling my wife, I was more nervous about this than I've been about a talk in some time. So thank you for having me, especially two days in a row. So thank you.
Yes, we'd like to thank Dr. Diggle and he's answered all of our questions. Um, just remember, if you want to see this again, we are, are recording it and your active living manager or wellness nurse will be able to tell you all about where it is. And for anyone who has tuned in and come online, it will be on our park YouTube and you will be able to see it. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Once again, on behalf of all of us here at Park, thank you, Dr. Diggle, and we really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you.